Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you are watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. Today we have a great show for you. We're talking about cerebral palsy in children. Cerebral palsy affects about one in 323 children in the United States. And CP, is an, as it's also known as, is the most common motor disability in childhood. My guest today is Dr. Jolene Brandenburg, who is a pediatric physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor at the Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Dr. Brandenburg specializes in treating children who have cerebral palsy. She's an assistant professor of pediatrics and physical medicine and rehabilitation, and I'm so excited that she can join us here today. We'll be taking your questions live, so please start sending them now, and we will try our best to get to all of them. Dr. Brandenburg, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for inviting me to talk about this. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great discussion. So cerebral palsy, it's kind of a, a more medical termed diagnosis. What does it actually mean? Well, cerebral palsy can be kind of confusing to parents. Um, it's actually a broad term that captures basically any um, infant who's had some sort of non-progressive and permanent injury to their brain. Um, so that could be something like their brain didn't develop properly when they were um, in the womb or they were born very, very early, which mm -hmm. is one of the most common causes of cerebral palsy. Okay. They could have also had an exposure to some sort of infection, um, either in the womb or shortly after birth, or even some sort of trauma very early in life, like during their infancy. Okay. Any of those things could be a cause of cerebral palsy. So basically anything that affects the brain. Okay. So if something has affected the brain um, in maybe a critical time of development or after, what would be the symptoms that parents would, would see in their child? Well, the symptoms for cerebral palsy can also be kind of variable mm -hmm. too. So some children with cerebral palsy have um, differences in their muscle movements and their muscle tone mm -hmm. very early on where parents will notice when they're trying to change the diapers for their babies that their muscles get real stiff or their legs are kind of crossing or scissoring. It's hard to change their diapers. Some babies can be kind of floppy where you really have to hold on to them um, even uh, longer than you would expect. So they don't get head control at a time when you would expect them to. They're not meeting those milestones and they have this sort of what we call low tone where they're just kind of they're just kind of floppy babies. So they could either be kind of stiff or kind of floppy. And both of those things could um, be signs that your child may have cerebral palsy. Okay. Parents may ask you, why does my child um, have different symptoms than another child with cerebral palsy? How do you respond to that question? That's a very good question. Um, because there's a lot of different causes of cerebral palsy. And there's cerebral palsy can affect any area of the brain. Mm -hmm. So it could be something quite mild that just affects one part of the brain and the child maybe has trouble with an arm and leg on one side of their body or it could be that the child's had an injury where they had a lack of oxygen for a period of time and have an injury that affects their entire brain. Mm -hmm. um, they're, depending on what part of the brain is affected can impact what that child's movement difficulties look like and what the therapies we would recommend for that child. Okay. You mentioned it's usually not a progressive um, diagnosis, meaning that things don't usually get worse. Is that what you would expect in most children with cerebral palsy? So that's a really difficult yeah, question okay. to answer. Um, but that's a really great question because yeah. the brain injury itself is, is a one-time event. So that injuries happened, um, the child has this scarring in their brain or a difference in how their brain forms, and that's what that child has. But as the child grows and develops, how that injury impacts their movement, um, impacts their activities can change. So we see some children who are doing okay, moving towards walking independently, may have some braces, but as they hit their growth spurt as a teenager, mm -hmm. that it's, it's harder for them to move around because mm -hmm. they've gotten bigger, they've gotten mm -hmm. heavier, and their body doesn't cooperate them. They can't make their muscles do what they want to do. And mm -hmm. it's not because their brain injury or difference that their brain is getting worse. It's because their body is changing and growing and, and they can't coordinate it as well as they get bigger. Okay. Can um, the injury that causes cerebral palsy affect other areas besides just kind of their motor development or fine motor development? Absolutely. So cerebral palsy is defined by having a, a disorder of how a child moves or sits. 
but we know that there are a lot of other things that can be associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, so children can have, they can develop um, tightness or contractures in their muscles mm -hmm. that make it hard for them to extend their arms or legs the way they're supposed to. Um, they can have troubles with how their bones uh, and joints mature because of that and, and may mm -hmm. need some surgeries on their bones or joints for that. They can have trouble with their learning, something s as simple as a visual spatial learning disorder to having a severe cognitive impairment. Okay. Some children that are more effective can have trouble with breathing, chewing, or swallowing. Uh, there's even a higher incidence of things like attention deficit disorders and autism spectrum disorders in children with cerebral palsy. Okay, so as, as their doctor um, who's helping manage these symptoms, these are other things they'd be looking for as children get older um, or are going to school. Absolutely. Okay. And it's important to bring these things up with your doctor and also at school, if the providers at school are seeing some differences and, and some concerns for other things. It, it can all be associated with the, the cerebral palsy. Who um, should be involved in, in the, the medical um, care and in their educational um, care for a child with, with cerebral palsy? Um, well, there's often, it's kind of a team or a family mm -hmm. approach to helping uh, parents uh, care for a child with cerebral palsy. Um, at Mayo, we approach it with a multidisciplinary clinic, meaning we have a lot of different providers, not just physicians, um, that are available to uh, help a family who has a child with cerebral palsy. Depending on the severity of cerebral mm -hmm. palsy and the other associated conditions, um, that could include a rehab physician like myself, mm -hmm. um, our nurse coordinator who helps the parents um, triage questions that they have mm -hmm. and get those questions to the right provider, okay. um, an orthopedic physician, a, a bone and, and joint and muscle doctor who is there in case the child needs some interventions for those um, bone or joint deformities, uh, a neurologist, because seizures can be associated with mm -hmm. cerebral palsy, uh, occasionally a neurosurgeon for certain interventions that we do to help with some of their um, increased tone or spasticity, or if a child has a, a VP shunt, a, a shunt into their brain to help reduce increased fluid. Mm -hmm. um, there's and then there's other providers available as, as needed. Um, there's social work that can help with access to resources, mm -hmm. help parents try and identify resources they didn't know that was available for things that insurance doesn't cover. Mm -hmm. um, a dietitian, as many of these children have difficulty with eating and difficulty with growing. And of course, our physical, occupational, and speech therapists mm -hmm. who not only can provide the long-term therapy interventions, but also can be there as uh, experts to intervene while the child is there to provide some recommendations for their home therapist to help them continue doing their activities. And at, in the school environment, there, there are programs that can help from birth all the way through their entire educational um, period that can help. What are some of those um, resources? Yeah. Yeah. So in a child who's, who's at risk of cerebral palsy, maybe they don't have the diagnosis yet, mm -hmm. but there are things that are suspicious that that child may be moving in that direction, some delays in development or differences in how they're moving. There's actually a government uh, mandate um, for a birth to three program, and it's through the Individuals with Disabilities mm -hmm. uh, Education Act. And so the birth to three program uh, basically is, is run differently in each state. Mm -hmm. And qualifications for this are also different in each state. Sometimes children have to have the diagnosis. Sometimes they just have to be at risk of it. Um, but providers, your uh, physician providers or therapists, uh, uh, can be helpful in referring you or your child to that program. And then what happens is somebody comes out to evaluate your child often in your home. Mm -hmm. And the birth to three program is generally done in an individual's home or even at a daycare center where the child's at. Mm -hmm. uh, they can provide some interventions basically through the age of three. Then after the age of three, those services are provided in a school setting. Okay. Before you mentioned that there's many different types of cerebral palsy, what are some of the different types or classifications um, that, that exist that kind of can change how you would manage treatment um, of the symptoms? So with the different types of cerebral palsy, we 
We classify and, and intervene based on a child's type of movement disorder. Mm -hmm. So if a child has a stiffness in their muscles that, that looks like spasticity, and spasticity is where um, when they're trying to move, the quicker they try to move, the harder it is to get their muscles to move. Or when a parent's trying to stretch them and you stretch their muscles really fast, it's harder to get their legs straight. Mm -hmm. But if you stretch them really slow, you can easily get them straight. Mm -hmm. So that's the spasticity. Um, there's also other type of movement disorders called dystonia, where a child seems to get fixed or locked in certain positions. Often they'll have hands that are fisted and their arms will be in extension. Um, there's also something called ataxia, where the kiddos seem to have a real difficult time with balance. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of say they look a little bit like Captain Jack Sparrow walking around. Um, they aren't, clearly, but yeah. they have that, diff right. that type of movement difficulties. <laughs> sure. And then there's also the kids that have low tone where they have, they're just, they're floppy. It's hard for them to mm -hmm. hold their head up. Mm -hmm. It's hard for them to sit up. Everything's kind of loose. And some kids will have a combination of these. Okay. There are things that we can do for, for uh, spasticity and dystonia as far as medications. Mm -hmm. um, however, the ataxia one is, is much difficult. I don't have a medication that can make a kid more coordinated. Mm -hmm. So really for ataxia, it's looking at therapies to try and help them with balance, try and help them with that neuroplasticity mm -hmm. to improve their balance. But often with those kids, once they get up and walking, we need to do things like helmet them because they're going to fall. Mm -hmm. um, the, hype, the kids with hypotonia, I also don't have medicines that are going to make them stiffer. Mm -hmm. And so for those kids, it's a lot of equipment, um, things like vests, like neoprene vests to help make them a little bit stiffer in their trunk, uh, lots of supportive equipment to help get them positioned so that they can be more upright and interact with individuals. But for spasticity and dy dystonia, we can look at medications, things that they'll take by mouth, um, things that we can do like shots into their muscles, mm -hmm. um, or even um, surgical interventions that may help with uh, adjusting that, that muscle stiffness with the goal of either improving their function mm -hmm. um, or trying to make them more comfortable relaxing those muscles so that's easier to do some of their cares and stretches. Okay. What are some of the type of to some of the types of medications that you use, um, either orally or injecting into the muscles to help with the spasticity? So oral medications that we use in include things like baclofen, that's probably the most common mm -hmm. one that we use, which is a medication that can be helpful for both spasticity and dystonia. Okay. Um, that one's given orally. Um, I typically think about using that medication in a child who's got um, increased muscle tone all over. And one of the reasons for that is one of the side effects is sedation. And we want to do as much as we can to keep these kids as awake as possible for their learning and their cognition. Mm -hmm. There's other medications that are um, benzodiazepine uh, class, so things like Valium, Clonazepam, that can help with muscle relaxation. Mm -hmm. Tend to think about using those a little bit more at night, like if the child's having these spasms, perhaps muscle cramps that are interfering with sleep, mm -hmm. because this medication can also make them quite sleepy. Mm -hmm. um, other medications are something like Dantrolene, which is a really old medication, mm -hmm but can be helpful in combination with some of the others because dantrolene acts right at the level of the muscle. Okay. So it doesn't affect their awareness mm -hmm. or alertness. And I truly think about those mm -hmm. in kids who certainly have, have tone that affects their entire body, where if we need to target a specific muscle, mm -hmm. um, say every time you change your child's diaper, they're scissoring and it's really hard to do and we really don't want them to do that, or they're having trouble with their hips because of that, mm -hmm. then we think about a medicine like botulinum toxin. And there's multiple different types of toxins available mm -hmm. now. Um, and those can be helpful because we can target particular muscles, but they're shots. Mm -hmm. And often they're very uncomfortable. So if mm -hmm. there's multiple muscles, say in an arm or in a leg that we're doing, we'll often do some level of sedation to help the child be more comfortable. Because it can be scary. Mm -hmm. Imagine just taking a child for vaccinations. They don't want to see the doctor once right. they start figuring out right. that, geez, when I go to the doctor, I'm going to be getting a shot. Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to come see me or any right. of the other doctors if they think or are worried that every so often I'm going to need to get a shot. Mm -hmm. So we find that that can be helpful in reducing some of that anxiety because these kids are going to need lifelong medical care. Absolutely, and we can try and coordinate any other procedures at the same time that we're doing the sedation for the, the botulinum in injections. Exactly, so. and we do that quite a bit, orthopedic procedures, or if the child has other difficulties where they need to have a, a tube, a feeding tube changed, or 
uh, any other sort of evaluation mm -hmm. or anesthesia, mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to do that in combination with other providers. So it's only one anesthesia for that. Absolutely. Um, you, met, you just mentioned orthopedic procedures and stuff like that. Let's talk about some of the ortho, orthopedic consequences and orthopedic procedures that maybe would be an option to help some of the children with spasticity and maybe other different types of CP. So we see, we tend to see more orthopedic complications in children who have more of the spastic type cerebral palsy. And part of that is because of the way the spasticity affects muscles. They have certain movement patterns with that. Mm -hmm. So I talk a lot about the legs, and it's primarily because in cerebral palsy, the legs are generally the most affected area. And so the kids with spastic cerebral palsy will often have a, a pattern of movement where their legs will scissor, meaning their legs will cross over each other. Um, and they'll often have their feet plantar flex, like they're on their tiptoes. And when they're in a position where their legs are crossing each other, it actually puts their hip joints in a position where it wants to dislocate. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that type of position a lot, your hips aren't going to develop the way that they're supposed to. And so we do interventions to try and optimize that hip development as much as possible in that. So that includes things like injections. Sometimes the children will wear splints at night between their legs to help keep them separated. Um, we'll do things with their equipment, like if they have a wheelchair, that will help keep their legs separated mm -hmm. to try and optimize that hip development. And certainly standing activities are very good for that. But even with all of that and stretching that parents do at home and the activities they're doing with therapy, mm -hmm. some children go on to have significant troubles with their hips. And so we monitor for that by doing hip x-rays, generally on a yearly basis. And as we start seeing a child having trouble with hips, have them introduced to their orthopedic provider so mm -hmm. that they can start having a relationship with them. Um, f because the surgery to prevent a hip dislocation is a more straightforward surgery than one that's done after a hip has dislocated. The same thing for scoliosis. Mm -hmm. Because their muscles aren't doing the work that they're supposed to be doing and working in a way that they're supposed to be working, these kids are at increased risk for scoliosis. So we're often watching for that early on, though we typically see it um, at a time when they're going through big growth spurts, like adolescence, like you would for other mm -hmm. scoliosis pictures. These kids can also develop contractures where their joints get stuck in a position because they have such severe tightness. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these kids, it seems like no matter what we throw at them from a medication standpoint, mm -hmm. they still have this very severe tightness. And so orthopedic surgery can be helpful in, in uh, uh, lengthening these muscles and tendons so that they have time where they don't have that tightness and then we continue to use these medications to try and help that. Mm -hmm. So physical activity is for all children is very, very important. How are we going to encourage that in children who may have some limitations in what they're able um, or how they're able to perform like walking and running and things like that. So this is something I love to talk about. Yes. Um, so we think about physical activity in these kids as physical therapy. And so the paradigm of how we think about therapy interventions has changed over time and a big part of this has been frankly because of insurance. It's not covering as much physical therapy as they used to in the past. And so we look at physical occupational speech therapy as therapies with a particular goal. You go to therapy with a particular goal in mind for what you want to get to, whether it be standing, uh, some equipment. Uh, my daughter has cerebral palsy. One of her goals was to try and walk with crutches. Okay. And so she did therapy for a period of time to work on that. Mm -hmm. But then these kids need to be doing things outside of therapy mm -hmm. to be able to capitalize on these gains that they're making. And so there's a lot of activities that they can mm -hmm. be doing within whatever skill set they have. And so there's things like adaptive parks and recs program. Now in Rochester, we have a phenomenal one mm -hmm. and there are many other cities around the country with that. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of folks who live in kind of a smaller community which don't have this type of mm -hmm. program, but they have other programs for kids of typical abilities like mm -hmm. just a regular t-ball program. Mm -hmm. And often what parents can do is call these programs up, call some of the coaches up and tell them about their child and say, you know, I'm really interested in having them participate. I'd be willing to help. Mm -hmm. Here are some of the things I think would be be helpful to allow them to do that right. and it's not only good for the child to get out and participate and socialize mm -hmm. with all the other kids it's good for the other kids to be more comfortable with somebody who moves uh, in a different way than they do mm -hmm. and be able to ask questions mm -hmm. and be able to understand gosh how they can help what mm -hmm. they can do and that 
this child is just like them. It just mm-hmm. they happen to have a little difference in their movement. Mm-hmm. So there's the, and there's other activities. Um, I you know my daughter's tried cheerleading. Mm-hmm. Um, she's tried acting class. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a strictly physical activity. Mm-hmm. Getting them out and letting them explore areas of interest that they have um, is is good for all children. And I found that most people are very open to, to having a child with a disability come mm-hmm. in. Once you talk to them about what that disability is and what sort of things you think would be helpful and how they can help you mm-hmm. do this. Mm-hmm. And, and schools are often uh, working... Uh, within like physical education adaptations and stuff as well to to make sure that these children are able to participate right absolutely um, with, their, with their peers and everything so they have adaptive physical education mm-hmm. in schools and that can be a great resource for parents to also ask about well what other equipment may be helpful to allow my child to be able to do a particular activity mm-hmm. we often find that in families they have a particular passion of a certain sport or a certain outdoor mm-hmm. activity and so our our therapists can be helpful in finding uh, ways to help adapt that activity. Recreational therapists can be very helpful in that too. Going online, talking with other parents mm-hmm. that have children with disabilities, see what have you done to make this possible so your child can can do this activity your family enjoys doing and do it together. Unfortunately, for a lot of these adaptive equipments, insurance doesn't cover it. And so families have found other ways to try and fund this. And that's Mm -hmm. where sometimes social worker can be helpful in in working through, well, what other resources are available that may help with getting that equipment? Um, GoFundMe certainly has Mm -hmm. changed the way some families are able to get equipment for their family. Um, And looking at things um, that other children have outgrown, often going online Mm -hmm. and resources like Craigslist, you can find things that other kids have outgrown and be able to pick it up at a much lower price. Absolutely. Do you have any tips for families um, to help kind of foster their interest in other activities they may not initially be very interested in engaging in? So I think, frankly, you need to treat them like every other yeah, child. Exactly. And, and sometimes, you know, you have the kiddo that you really want them to take piano lessons because you know that's going to be helpful for them down the road or it's something you did as a kid. And either we're really <laughs> regretting that you didn't yeah. continue with that. Right. Um, the same thing for your mm-hmm. child with cerebral palsy or mm-hmm. any other disability. Encourage them to do that activity. Mm-hmm. And, and some of these, yeah, they're... They're not going, they may not be a world class pianist, but some of those fine motor skills that you can mm-hmm. learn by playing piano is going to be very helpful and therapeutic for them. And they may actually enjoy it after they start doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's treating them in that same manner that you would every other kid and mm-hmm. in, in, in getting them to try the different things. And if you've had other kids that have liked different activities, chances are your, your child with a disability is going to like to do that too. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any other advice for parents um, who are raising a child with cerebral palsy? Um, gosh, that's a great question. So as a parent of a child mm-hmm. with cerebral palsy, I, I kind of look at it from a different perspective, probably because of being a physician and also caring for kids. Mm-hmm. But I try and get my kiddo out to do everything that we do um, and include her in what we do. We like to travel. Mm-hmm. She travels with us. Um, I like to ride horses. She rides horses with us. We figured out how to adapt a bike so that she can ride a bike Mm -hmm. with us. And I think that's the key to um, uh, raising a child is is not limiting them, Mm -hmm. is encouraging them to explore what they want to do. And it may be something that's completely different. They may have an interest in art and you're an engineering family. (laughs) Um, You never know. Right. And so giving them that opportunity to explore it in whatever manner they can and encouraging others around them to help them be able to do that, I think, is the key. And always asking, is there more? Is there something Mm -hmm. else? Where else can I look for this? And then when you do find things, share it. I learned so much from the families that I see, and Mm -hmm. I've taken some of those clues like things about tennis shoes that can fit over braces um i've gotten so much information from parents Mm -hmm. who've who have found it through networking with each other Mm -hmm. and so that sharing of information once you get it is really important absolutely and there's a lot of online communities um, where parents can share information and we we have some actually through our mayo clinic site called mayo clinic connect where families can connect and share this information as well. That's a phenomenal yeah, opportunity yeah. to be able to do that. Absolutely, because like you said, we learn the most from our patients, I feel like. Exactly, mm-hmm. and then you're not out there alone exploring it, and maybe 
spending time when somebody else has already been mm-hmm. there, done that, found that, and they'll give you time to look for other things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is all the time we have for today, and it was a great show. Did oh. you have anything else that you wanted to add? It goes fast, doesn't it? It goes really yeah. fast. They have so much more to say. Well, tell, what else, do you have anything else you want to share? Um, well, just talking yeah. about other things that we do for the kids. You right. know, we haven't been able to touch upon bracing yeah, that we do. Let's talk and, about bracing. Um, so with the kids, we often use different equipment okay. to help them be able to do the activities that right. they want to do. So there's braces that we use for their feet and ankles, braces that we can use for their hands, different types of wheelchairs and setups for their wheelchairs, things like standers to get kids up who aren't able to mm-hmm. walk, different types of walkers and things called gait trainers right. that can help kids walk who can't do it by themselves. We have a picture of, uh, of the we- do we have a picture yeah. of a yeah. in particular it's a it's called an ankle foot orthosis we use the term afos a lot and this one is a hinged afo that we're putting on and taking off and this is a very common type of brace that we use in kids with cerebral palsy to help give them more stability at their foot and ankle and with this we use lots of different types of therapies um, but it's really exciting what's available out there to help these kids do the best that they can with the body that they have. Mm-hmm. What are some other types of therapies? I know we have another picture um, showing a treadmill and some. Ah, yes. Yeah. yes. So this is so. There's lots of therapies in yeah. general. We start with goal-directed therapy to look at a kid's development. Okay. Um, but there are other interventions that we can do. This is one intervention called locomat or a, a robotic locomotor training. And which we can do in children depending on their size. So this little one, that's actually my little one when she, a few years ago. Um, and that was, she's about as little as you can be to fit in this particular device. But it helps work on um, walking in a manner where you have something supporting you and working on training in that normal walking pattern. And this typically goes well with doing then what we call overground therapy, where when you come off that machine, then you work on walking with your walker and okay. walking in a regular manner too. Okay. So there's a lot of different, and there's also things like hippotherapy, horseback riding therapy, which can be really good for trunk control, aquatic therapy for kids who aren't able to walk or are working on optimizing their walking but need some body support of that water. Um, Is there any other types of therapies that you guys use? Certainly. There's Mm -hmm. things like um, constraint-induced therapy where children who have one side of their body affected Mm -hmm. will actually cast that good arm to force them to use the arm that they're having more difficulty with. Excellent. Um, Well, thank you so much. Do you have anything else that you wanted to add? I can't think of yes. anything at this point. Okay, sounds good. Well, if you think of other things, we'd be happy to have you on again yes. and learn more about cerebral palsy or maybe even other topics that you cover. In that would be basis. phenomenal. Yeah. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. Well, that is the end of our show. Dr. Brandenburg, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, join me next on July 13th at 10 a.m. for our next installment of Ask the Mayo Mom. My guest will be Dr. Denise Klinkner. She is a specialist um, in pediatric surgery, and she's also the head of the pediatric Uh, Trauma Center at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. We'll be talking about chest wall deformities in children um, at that visit, so please join us, send questions in advance if you have any, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Have a great day.